Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy. And I'm recording this on the 23rd of September 2024. So it's all equinox-ish. So everywhere from the north right down to the south to the equatorial realm that I'm in at the moment are all on 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night. So um, you pull buggers in the far north of the world where I used to live, you've got to watch your days getting, you know, progressively shorter at an alarmingly fast rate of three or four minutes a day. While here where I am, we're barely going to lose like 20 minutes of daylight between here now and um, winter solstice. And uh, it's not really enough to notice, that's the thing. So anyway, what I would like to talk about in today's episode is, of course, uh, did counterculture or what's been known in more recent times as alternative culture, did that create the tyranny that the Western world finds itself in at the moment? And, um, you know, did it or did it not? Or did it play a huge part in doing so? Because I do wonder about that. You see, if you were to take it right the way back to the beginning of, um, if you like, the post-war youth cultures, which you take you around about the time of the 1950s, and I'd like to have a look at the whole um, historical context. In the sort of musical sense, I would divide this into um, anything that came from about 1956 onwards, which is uh, Bill Haley and the Comets, Rock Around the Clock, Elvis Presley, Little Richard, all that, right up until 1985, where Live Aid happened, and as a result of this, the terrible, edgy rock stars or pop stars who were always seen as, um, I want to say, the counterculture and on the fringes of the establishment, suddenly became respectable because they were doing stuff for charity, right? So they were all part of the respectability class. And then from, from about the middle of the 1980s onwards, um, is when the uh, the terms mainstream and alternative became very uh, what you would call very clearly defined. Um, up until then, it was just uh, there was nothing like that. So uh, it all started. If you look at it from the political um, perspective, then I would say in the 1950s, just as rock and roll was happening in America, of course, you had. McCarthyism and they were very very anti-communist this was the early stages of the Cold War and um, as a result of uh, World War II um, for those of you who know your history and know your onions um, Winston Churchill was pretty much um, you know uh, aware of the fact that he had uh, strange bedfellows he had to align with someone who otherwise would have been his enemy Joseph Stalin and when they both together had uh, and of course Eisenhower as well, got to throw him in because I mean, wouldn't have been one without America's involvement too. Um, when uh, that war ended, um, Winston Churchill pretty much announced that you know, we're in a cold war with Russia. So, um, you know, because, uh, because he knew that um, Stalin was not really a good guy, it was just politically expedient to be on the same side of it as him because they had to defeat Hitler. So as a result of this, this meant that over the next decade or so in uh, the Western, particularly in America, this uh, anti-communist thing reached fever pitch. So, uh, so when you had Joseph McCarthy there accusing everyone of being a communist, this is not something that got really out of hand. And as a result of that, you can then um, argue that uh, there's definitely some correlation, if you like, between the radical anti-communist sentiment that they had um, in the 50s and the beginning of the Vietnam War in the 1960s. And of course, as a result of all of this, uh, the music and the countercultures that have happened, you know, um, I don't really know what happened in uh, America. I suppose you had the rock and rollers, didn't you? You had the rockers and stuff like that. And uh, whereas in Britain you had the rockers, but then you also had other things coming in in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, like the beatniks who were still very clean cut and suited but a little bit bohemian, and they were sort of the precursor to the hippies. And then you had the uh, sharp-suited mods, who were called, well, which is short for modernists. And so you had these types of countercultural things that were going on at the time, as well as the leather-jacketed rockers, um, who would have been into, you know, people like Gene Vincent and what, you know, Biba Palula, she's my baby, and all that, right? So you had these early stages of um, grassroots counterculture that was happening at the time. But then as the uh, 60s progressed, now this was more so in America because you had the McCarthyism, but then you also had the civil rights movements and uprisings and stuff like that, which were predominantly American. And um, then of course the universities, etc., and protests, what, what were going on at the time. And as uh, 
would you say the psychedelic revolution came in as well as the music changed from the early 60s to the late 60s and the beatniks um, gave way to the hippies right what you find yourself with is uh, the beginning of a, a cultural political as well as musical movement and um, this was probably the beginning of the uh, of the what do they call it the long march of the institutions of the of the left at the time a lot of people who had just been into the music and weren't really into being political activists would have been quite apolitical. But, it was, but the rebellion was always off the left back in those days. And it was very different to the way it's turned out to be now, you know? So uh, they were rebelling against the norm, the cultural norms, the whole sort of bohemian look that came in in the 60s and then sort of uh, ended up uh, into the 1970s, if you like, uh, would have had... Um, an effect on that so after the 1980s come along as we went into the post-punk and new wave eras of the 1980s um, real underground scenes were forming underground scenes that weren't really given media attention were so elusive and in an era where there was no internet you had to go out and find them and they were kind of secret in a way and you just had to stumble upon it word of mouth would lead you to it and then you'd find these clubs to go and that's where you got all the sort of post new romantics and sort of like uh goths and stuff like that so i uh, ended up being caught up in all of that and of course in the 1980s um, everything went a little bit more slick so you had these people who would call themselves casuals that's phrases i'm um, kind of gone fallen by the wayside and that's something that people have forgotten about but the thing about the casuals is that they were kind of like something that i suppose maybe have descended from the mod culture it was a working class thing and people were smartly dressed but this was more they were less formal rather than wearing sharp suits they were now wearing things like you know pringle jumpers stay pressed trousers nike trainers that sort of thing so they're often wearing a lot of the sort of, um and, and of course blokes had what you would call the football mullets often with highlights in their hair it was a very 1980s look the girls um often looked like sort of blonde blue mascara type of thing musically it'd be like the blokes would be listening to artists like like level 42 and the girls were into all the stock Aitken and waterman productions so it was a very that was something that you would say from about 1985 onwards right was something that you would define as mainstream culture at least in britain where i came from and then after that era um you got to the point where um uh the alternative culture that were forming it was like goths um, post new romantics that sort of thing and um, if you went to the clubs what sort of soundtrack would it have it would have bands like gene loves jezebel the bolshoi the alien sex fiend uh, uh there's uh yeah sisters of mercy and there were a few artists that kind of shared both mainstream and alternative platforms as well and this included like the likes of the smiths um the cure susie and the banshees etc so a defining line um if you like between mainstream and alternative from about the middle of the 1980s was very obvious to see at least in the culture that i came from um when it comes to the people who were like more like the hard left you know they were the people who were into billy bragg and stuff like this and they they really did uh, they were proper cosplay che guevara pretenders you know who were into their militant labor and into their socialist worker but the thing is when it came to music and fashion and style it was not very politicized back then right that's the thing and um you know a lot of people like to say oh you know especially a lot of the more conservative there's this resurgence to conservatism that seems to be around a lot now on the political right where they just want to bring back the 1950s you know have everyone um what is it be virgins right up till they get married get married early live very normal conservative lives and bring back the 1950s a, a world which of course was very soul destroying for a lot of people and that's why people rebelled against it and they say that everything that happened from the 60s onward is responsible for the woke world and no I don't personally buy that to me it's like blaming Led Zeppelin for all hair metal bands or it's like blaming Nietzsche for Hitler I don't think um, this is the way it was I mean I just I think it was a byproduct if you like as we went into this time um, we find ourselves in a time now where there's this kind of victim culture human rights for the oppressed and all of that which of course also inc includes subcultures just as much as it does other religions other races and foreigners you know so this oppressor oppressed narrative this kind of perpetrator victim narrative that we have at the moment um it's just a mentality um i wouldn't say that you know society fell by the wayside and started to decay in the 1960s um you know 
and that all counterculture and all, everything that came from rock and roll was I would not say that was bad. I would say that historians in the future will be looking at the music that came out this time as a, a renaissance period of sorts, a kind of grassroots working class renaissance era. And I think that um, I stand by that. But the thing is, of course, is that when it comes to how does counterculture, how did counterculture play its part in bringing about the tyranny that we have now? It's to do with the fact that you have your grassroots side and then you have your astroturf side. The grassroots is like, I mean, the best, uh, if you was going to get two people from one era and I was going to describe the difference between grassroots and, and, um, and uh, astroturf, I would say Johnny Rotten versus Malcolm McLaren. Malcolm McLaren had this great idea that he wanted, um, you know, these young tearaways that would become his band, the Sex Pistols, who he managed um, to, uh, to uh, fuck the establishment, as it were, you know. So when they had the opportunity to do that, these two, um, was it Johnny Rotten, um, who uh, grew up in a poor Irish immigrant family, and Steve Jones, who grew up in a very much working class broken home, when they had the chance to swear on ITV, uh, on Bill Grundy's show, um, which ended Bill Grundy's career, incidentally, and he was clearly drunk when he done that, um, for any of you who want to um, see that. Uh, Malcolm McLaren didn't like it, he goes, you can't swear on television, like that, that's what he says, and then Johnny Rotten pretty much said to him, oh, there's Malcolm, wants us to uh, rebel and fuck the world and that, but when we actually do it, he backs the establishment, and this is true, and um, you know, uh, when Malcolm McLaren, I would say that, uh, the best way I would describe him is, he's, uh, I would describe him as a hip-hop person, not in the sense of the type of music or genre that you think of as a hip uh, as hip hop. The, the etymology of the phrase hip hop comes from hop on to whatever is hip, right? And that's exactly what Malcolm McLaren did. He um, set, he's, he's a self styled mogul, media mogul, um, and what he would do is he would just basically jump onto anything that was the latest craze and find a way of capitalizing on it. That's what he would do. Um, but uh, he was not, he was obviously a very sociopathic person and he was just all out for what he could gain and what he could pocket pretty much and uh, you know if other people that he was using outlived their usefulness he just to hell with them. Um, so that's the thing um, and he did seem to come across at least in my experience watching Malcolm McLaren over the years as somewhat amoral you know. <laughs> the thing. Whereas uh, that's, that's the ultimate dichotomy, the grassroots or the astroturf. And as I kind of um, have been in and out of all of these different scenes myself, one of the things that I noticed before I got away from Totnes, where I used to live, and when I got away from the Psytrance scene that, that I found myself being a kind of, hmm, not really part of, no, an outlier within, right, was there were definitely a lot of university-educated um, kids who were in that proto-woke stage, and this was taking over everything. You know, this kind of radical politicisation of everything was taking over everything. And it didn't take many years after before I realised that actually this so-called alternative culture, or this had, what had now become pseudo-alternative culture, had now become the establishment. And I just felt dirty as a result of being involved in anything that was even just remotely alternative. And then um, I find myself in this very strange um, era now where the one group of people who are trying to come across as the outliers are the political right and the conservatives. And I don't really have that much in common with them either. I don't, because they're, uh, you know, I look at them and think, oh, okay, I don't mind siding with the underdog because that's what I'm like. I'm, you know, I don't fit into anything, so that's okay with me. If I see a group of people become the underdogs, I'll naturally kind of find, align myself with them up to a point. But I'm not part of that. There is a, not much, if you like, in the, li in, the, uh, in the line of Venn diagram between me and the uh, right-wing conservative, except for the fact that um, I am, let us say, maybe, let's say, into small government, free markets, and, uh, you know, freedom to say what you want. Um, I'm not, in I'm into political individualism but as far as that's about that's about it but when it comes to um, what used to be the apolitical left of the alternative I mean I'm just as much into uh, certain bits of that as well you know but they were into freedom of expression they were into experimentation and art and stuff like that before but they seem to have become a lot more puritanical over the years right so I do think that there is something there that somehow because um, you know uh, 
for all those who do know the history of communism because uh, the working classes of the West would not join up and uh, workers of the world unite because they didn't need to because the, the meritocracy was very much more in their favour than it was in the Eastern countries. Um, the communists ended up not liking Western working class people because they couldn't assimilate them to their agenda. But they've done a very good job of doing it to the middle class people and the university educated people as well. And of course, um, that type of political leftism that we have needs to have an enemy. Where once it was the bourgeoisie, now it's the old proletariat. And the bourgeoisie themselves are now the proletariat and the, uh, the proletariat are now the bourgeoisie. So in, um, instead of having like the, uh, the, 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 the say that, the, the people with money, the, the bourgeoisie types, being the oppressor, it now has to be um, the closer you are to being male, white and heterosexual and all that and indigenous to Western countries, the more you are closer to being the oppressor class and uh, the more levels of intersectionality that take you away from that, the more you are part of the good guys who were closer to what the old proletariat used to be in that way. So they have reinvented communism. Of course, uh, counterculturalism comes into that because if you are, if you appear to be countercultural in your appearance, blue hair, nose piercings, that sort of thing, it looks like a very uh, sat and a very tacky, terrible version of uh, of what happened in the 1980s and the 1990s. It doesn't look anywhere near as stylish, and these people aren't anywhere near as good looking as they were. They look quite dysgenic these days, don't they? Yeah. So they've kind of hijacked that kind of alternative appearance and as a result of that, uh, it, I personally just think, well, I, I want to distance myself from that mu as much as possible. I don't want anything to do with that at all, you know. So um, I have been caught up in a lot of this because I was a misfit and I was never a normie in society. So I gravitated towards all of these things and then I realised, actually, no, the countercultural thing, up to a point it's all right, but it is a trap. And so it, it basically has been, you know, infused via, especially via those who've been to university and that, with a lot of very bad far left ideas, um, which are akin to communism. And um, if you think that the counterculture would be counter to the Vietnam War and McCarthyism, going back to that, it makes perfect sense that the hippies, if you like, would um, be kind of um, finding themselves aligning with uh, that kind of political leftism and the long march of communism, if you like, through the institutions of the Western world would uh, astroturf that grassroots, so to speak. So, you know, another example of a Malcolm McLarenization of a Johnny Rotten phenomenon, so to speak. Right, I have to check my notes because I did write down a few things that I want to talk about here and I've um, just got to make sure, right, oh yeah. So of course, a few things that have come along as well is like postmodernism, um, deconstructionism, and Malthusianism. These are things that I uh, want to talk about. Now, it means that you can't have arguments with people. You can't have actual debates with people. I, f I tried this with feminists, you know, where they would uh, try to uh, be postmodern and somewhat deconstructivist about your argument about her being a woman and becoming prime minister. And they say, um, well, what about Margaret Thatcher? Feminists should like her because she became prime minister. Some of them say, oh, she's a man, which is a very postmodernist and deconstructionist way of looking at a woman. And they say, no, she was a woman. Uh, yeah, but she was part of the patriarchy. And then I have to say to them, yes, but she was a woman and nothing got in the way of or stopped her from becoming prime minister. You just couldn't have these conversations. You, know, you couldn't get them to, to grasp even basic premises. Margaret Thatcher was a woman. Nothing got in the way of her becoming prime minister. Full stop. Didn't matter that she was a part of the patriarchy. She was still a woman. And of course, you couldn't have these conversations with them. Because if she weren't a man, then if she wasn't a man, like they often said, then she was part of the patriarchy. I thought, well, it doesn't matter that she's part of the patriarchy. All that matters is she's a woman. Either a woman can become prime minister or a woman can't become prime minister. But of course, you couldn't have these um, conversations with them. And then I tried to understand, you know, this is, this is like you get a lot of these kind of non-arguments with woke people these days. And what does it come down to? It comes down to postmodernism and deconstructionism. Which basically, they deconstruct your argument, but they don't have an argument of their own. That's um, usually how it works. 
Um, as a result, they deconstruct the conversation in real time while you're trying to have them so that they can't have that conversation with you because they actually don't have an argument at all. Right? And then, of course, um, you know, you've got postmodernism, which is great because um, there is only one absolute truth in postmodernism. And that one absolute truth in postmodernism is that there are no absolute truths in postmodernism. And they sort of they believe this un ironically which is really daft. So this kind of way of thinking comes in. So as a result, you can't actually have arguments with them. So they deconstruct the language, they deconstruct the, the arguments, and they, can, they cloud everything over with just chaos and confusion, kind of like uh, 1984 style, I suppose. It's a bit Orwellian. Um, and uh, I would say that this manipulation of language to, manip to cloud over what the truth is and to take away our ability to form arguments um, that we need to have is very 1984. Maybe that's a thing George Orwell probably accidentally invented postmodernism before, like Foucault and Derrida and all of those 1960s academics come along and did it too. But um, this is something that seems to have happened. And of course, Malthusianism, the belief that there are too many people in the world and there need to be fewer, right? How that's fused with the green thing. They're all talking about the reduction of carbon, but we know that um, we are the carbon that they wish to reduce. And that seems to be a very, very dominant narrative. You know, the world's going to end, we need less people, we need to um, uh, rewild the earth, and, you know, we need to stop uh, modernising the world. And it doesn't matter if we get to the point where we, we um, deconstruct civilization itself. Um, that's all right, it doesn't matter if we all die out, because at least the earth won't be killed by us. Stupid. Until, of course, one day the sun turns into a red giant and engulfs the earth. Yeah? That's another thing, you know. But at least it won't be humans who'll be responsible for it. And the opposite school of thought to Malthusianism seems to come from someone like Elon Musk. He thinks there should be more people. And his reason for why there should be more people is because if there's more people, yes, there might be more stupid people, but that means there are also more geniuses who can come up with some breakthrough ideas. You know, and that's the thing. It's like, um, you know, for a long time, people didn't know the power of coal. That's why they were burning wood. And um, the greenies, the Malthusianist greenies, don't tell you that until coal was discovered, we were actually um, cutting down more trees. And then when coal was discovered, uh, more trees grew back after that than at any other time. You know? um, of course, it, it, coal's dirty and what have you, but then, of course, they discovered gas and um, petroleum oil, which again is less dirty, and then over time, yes, we're using these dirty fuels, but the refineries and the filters and um, you know the converters and all of that have actually made these things become cheaper, cleaner, more efficient, and all of that. Um, but the trouble is, if we have to go all wind and solar and we have to deindustrialize the world now and we have to make everyone deindustrialize the world now, then it basically means that we don't have any of the scientific instruments, we don't have any of the technology anymore, we don't have the means to power any of the technology anymore, and as a result of that, we're going to have to go back to the Stone Age and all this knowledge will be forgotten and we will not be able to maintain our standard of living and we will not be able to improve things. Whereas Elon Musk, his idea is that, yeah, maybe there should be 9 or 10 billion people and maybe as a result of that, there will be more people with high IQs. And as a result, there will be more geniuses, and some geniuses will invent our way out the mess that we're in at the moment. Now, he wants to go to Mars, and he wants to um, turn us into a multi-planetary species. Now, a lot of people think that's a crazy idea because they can't grasp it. I personally have no problem with that. I think, yeah, maybe that's what we need to do. Maybe, as we became very sentient, and we became aware of the universe, and we became like aware of uh, ourselves, and we became aware of our, we are able to self-reflect. We're different from all the other animals that there are, and we know what space is. And we're, the, we're, we're the only species, and uh, uh, you know, the, literally the only species as a concept of space, and you know, can actually uh, that knows that names the planet, that knows where we are in space, knows where knows that there is a such a thing as a galaxy, you know and there are other galaxies out there um, and that's the thing we know this so I think that yeah maybe that's if some people wish to do that find a way of being able to go into space well and to other planets well why not and even if they are living in artificial environments well why not if some people wish to do that if some people want to stay on earth and live in the natural world then why not too and um, I think that uh, there's room for all of these ideas 
Um, the Malthusian idea is a terrible one because the whole idea of that is that there are too many people and they want there to be fewer. So the greenies are the ultimate totalitarians, and why we call them watermelons, communist red on the, um, what's it, red on the inside but green on the outside. They're actually very bad for us because they're not trying to pioneer or invent their way out of the mess that we are creating. No, they're just basically trying to bring the earth to a standstill using technology that is not suitable. And that is, I don't know, that's dumb. So, you know, I can't, it makes them look to me like uh, more of a cult than anything else. There's another doomsday death cult and there's plenty of them and there have been historically pl plenty of them. They're not, right? So the whole thing about social justice and human rights as well is another issue too. Now, just to give you an idea of someone who's um, working counter to the way the globalists want to work is Nayib Bukele in um, El Salvador. Because I mean, all right, he's done a few, he's done a few very unusual things. Like he's, he's made Bitcoin a uh, legal tender in uh, El Salvador, which I think is a great idea because actually what that means is that the volcanoes that he has that he can use to power geothermal plants can be used to power the electricity of Bitcoin miners, which basically means he can literally turn energy into money. He can make saving the world profitable. And no one else has come up with that idea and no one else is doing that. And the Greenies don't talk about that, funnily enough, no. But that, I think, is a great idea. But the most important thing is, here this gang, they're called MS-23, and in order to join the gang in El Salvador, you had to rape or murder your way into membership of this gang, and it made El Salvador one of the most dangerous places. Bukele just basically built all these super prisons, rounded them all up and stuck them in prisons. Because the thing is, the gangs are very easily identifiable by their tattoos. But the flipping bleeding hearts, lefty, wokey, globalist, human rights types are more worried about the human rights of the criminals who rape and murder their way into the membership of gangs than they are into the safety of the people. And now, uh, because Bukele decided, well, fuck all this social justice and human rights globalism stuff that we're having shoved down our throats by the rest of the world, we're just going to bang up all these bastards and we're going to just wipe their history, we're going to get rid of it. And he's turned El Salvador into the safest country in the Western Hemisphere. And he's done it in a very, very short amount of time. While while uh, Europe and America have um, got this immigration issue, which of course you're not allowed to question because if you do that then suddenly you're racist and uh, was it Kia's storm troopers will come knocking on your door for saying things you, they think you shouldn't say, you know what I mean? So uh, the, the Western world, uh, because I don't know, hasn't found a way of doing it properly. Now of course, you know, there will be people who argue, well, maybe because of the way things are at the moment in the Western world, it needs immigration in order uh, for things to go right and I think it would be okay if they knew how to manage it right but they don't know how to manage it right and they're making an absolute pig's ear of it and um, so that's the trouble and we got to the point now where they're more interested in the human rights of the wrong ones than they are the human rights of the you know indigenous people who don't like being um, what's it? don't like being made to feel like they're being replaced they're pointing fingers and calling everyone right-wing Nazi all of that sort of stuff when the truth of the matter is that there's not enough communication around, there's not enough dialogue, there's not enough people listening to everyone, too much political polarization. And of course, uh, they're not really interested in talking to people to find out, well, how can we manage this better? There's also a lot of collusion between the black market, NGOs, governments, um, backhanders, blind eyes, that sort of thing. And because they have not got a clue what they're doing, because no one is in control, and because literally no one is in control and no one knows how to control it, we are in a rudderless ship at the moment, uh, and uh, they are losing control of the narrative, and that's basically why they're trying to take freedom of speech away, because they know they are losing control of the narrative, but they haven't got a clue what they're doing. The whole thing is just corrupt. Corruption is like rotting everything. Everything's rotten to the core. No one knows how to deal with it. I think it's just as much cock up as it is conspiracy. A lot of people think it's just a conspiracy. A bunch of, um, what was it, cat stroking villains sitting there planning and directing it all out. But I think, it's, uh, I think it's just a combination of incompetence, corruption, and maybe a little bit of evil because there always is. You know, that's the thing. 
but there's many factors making things what they are. And so we end up in this world where, coming back to what I started talking about, I personally honestly think that the, a certain victim mentality that came from, uh, you, know, you know, what to say, oppressor, oppressed. Rather than having the hard kids running everything at the moment, we've now got what we used to call the school spanners or the spasmos, as we used to call them in the 1970s, the more geeky elements, the kids who were bullied at school, uh, who are now, as I say, getting the nerd's revenge as the adults running the world right now. Right? And that, I mean, you know, that, that means that we must care more about people who are minor, minority. This is now a tyranny of minorities rather than the tyranny of the majority. So uh, it could be anything from a woman to a trans to person of colour to and even a subculture like goth or whatever to gay or whatever. You see, they're now part of what they call the oppressed class. They're all lumped in with it. And there are plenty of people who are, some, a lot of people who are these things, but don't want to be politically pigeonholed in with it because they're not far left individuals. And, um, and then of course they're treated like the ultimate Judases and traitors. And, um, so, so yeah, this kind of, uh, what they call it, nerd's revenge, combined with postmodernism and deconstructionism, destroying our culture, creating a void that otherwise, um, you know, uh, that it basically is allowing the cohesion that glues the culture together to fall to pieces, not considering that all it takes is a competing culture that is more united and more cohesive to then compete with the culture that you are destroying and take it over from within. And I will not be any more specific than that, but you know what I mean. We didn't see it coming. And then of course, well, they, they, you know, they often talk about how if people, uh, if you take God away, instead of believing in nothing, people believe in anything. One um, way of, uh, one, one of my best allegories to this was actually Terry Pratchett's The Hogfather. Terry Pratchett was a writer of the Discworld novels. It's basically like a, a parallel version of another Earth, but an Earth with magic on it. It had a lot of um, festivals in it that were parallel to the festivals that we have here on Earth. And the Hogfather was like their version of Santa Claus. And then um, a bunch of entities uh, come up with a way of stopping people believing in him. So he disappeared, right? As a result of that, there was suddenly no Hogfather. So as a result, um, when people started mentioning anything, like someone said, uh, oh, I wonder if uh, I wonder if there's a what is it a goblin who, who uh, steals your hair and then suddenly uh, a hair stealing goblin appeared right that sort of thing and someone said there's a god of wine but there isn't a god of hangovers and then suddenly phew, this man who was the god of hangovers appeared right so it was like a, a literal allegory of that that people started believing in things and then suddenly all of these entities came into being right uh, and I thought well that's exactly what's happened we've got the chaos now where People believe all sorts of things. Now, my whole attitude uh, towards all of this is that, um, you know, I'm still to some degree of the Robert Anton Wilson school of thought. I like to suppose a lot of stuff rather than form belief systems around them, right? I like, and I know what I know, and I know what I don't know. And I like to suppose a lot of things. So I don't mind supposing Jesus. I don't mind, you know, supposing Buddha, supposing God. Um, because then at least that kind of keeps in my, my mind open. I realise that, uh, well, I know I have to have a, I know I have to have a, a moral compass, and this comes from me supposing God, acting like He might exist, and that His moral compass trying to keep me on the straight and narrow. Maybe God, may be not, but it's something that um, I kind of feel that can keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, which I kind of think is a very important thing to do. We need to learn how to be on the straight and narrow now. And if we are finding ourselves in a world where we are, as I say, post-traditional, post-modern, post-Christian, post all of these things, and we have to find a way of getting our, of gelling it all back together again, uh, but in a way where that doesn't, that isn't regressive, then we really do need to think, you know, hard about how we're going to do this. And um, so these are these is. This is one of the reasons why I like to go off on these odd tangents, coming back to where I started. I do believe that the alternative scenes, 
which were often, I have to say, made up of misfits, made up of kids who were nerds when they were at school, couldn't fit in with the normie kids, right? And they're the ones who often became goths and what have you. They're the, they're the ones who often um, became alternative underground um, and they managed to kind of become cool for the first time by finding a way of being able to be something outside of the mainstream. But because of the sort of weak victim mentality and a kind of desire for a nerd's revenge that come along, and this is mostly noticeable with the middle class kids, I, th I think, right, that once they got power, once they've become to be the establishment, this, uh, they basically put things back as they were, but in a new form. This is like a new form of tyranny. Because there might be a lot of people out there that want to break away from the system, and there might be a lot of people out there that want to change the system. But in amongst those are the people who want to become the new system or run the new system. And power seems to always gravitate towards these people. So it doesn't matter what you escape from or to. You've got to watch out that any countercultural form that you are in now could become a new dictatorship in the future. So you've got to watch out for all those people who are conservative and right wing trying to come up with a counter narrative to the narrative because that will be, you know, you'll get, you'll get sort of Dick Cheney's and Mary Whitehouse's being formed in those people in a new sort of more right wing based cultural paradigm that might exist in the future. And so my, um, my thing is that you kind of got to keep a sense of autonomy from all of these ideological um, fluctuations that happen. Even if you were part of something, if it goes wrong, you kind of got to be, be able to find a way out of that. You've got to be able to keep a certain level of individualism, sovereignty, or autonomy. And the internet being the way it is, and people like me talking on the internet, not just people like me, but lots of people with lots of YouTube channels out there, the thing that, with them is that um, it's very easy for them to oversimplify and then define a paradigm. But it might be wrong for you. And this is one of the things I say, you know, I'm just some bloke on the internet, don't define your paradigm by mine. I like to encourage people to think outside of everything. And then, you know, from that, we can work out where we're going. Well, maybe you can, maybe you can't, but at least we would try. Right, it's been a bit of a long one. I've been waffling and droning on, talking off the hind legs off of donkeys. I shall uh, make my way down this hill now and head home. See you later, alligator. See you soon. Baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.